The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Okay. Um, obviously, this is a talk about Puppy Linux. Um, before I start off, has anyone here actually ever used Puppy Linux before? Okay. Now, the follow-up question which I'm going to ask, I'm going to predicate that with a statement, is most people when I tell them that I'm a Puppy Linux developer, their usual response is something along the lines of, oh, I love Puppy, it's such a great system. Followed quickly by the next statement of, I used it once. So, has anyone used Puppy Linux more than once? Okay, like I thought, some hands went down. That's perfectly fine. A lot of people use it to restore systems, get data off another system that OS is bad, dead, whatever. That's fine. As a developer, if I can provide a product that you guys can use, even if it's only once that I've helped you out, I'm happy. Um, so with this talk, I'm going to be talking about some of the different things with Puppy, how it's made, how it works. It's not going to be too technical. I'm going to explain some things, but we're not going to get digging deep into the code. It's going to be an overview of how the system runs. Um, this is a little bit different than probably some of the other um, talks that you've heard. My hope is that this will obviously be the best. Um, so to take the line from the IT crowd, um, put seat belts on your ears because I'm going to take them for the ride of their lives. Okay, who I am. Uh, my name is JT Pennington. I'm a security consultant by day. I'm also one of the producers of the Linux Action Show and Linux Unplugged with Jupiter Broadcasting. I don't know if any of you have ever watched that podcast. If you have, thank you, welcome, continue to watching. If you haven't, feel free to check it out. Um, I'm a puppy Linux developer. I go by the name of Q5Sys. Um, and these are the uh, versions that I've put out. All of them have been x64 or ARM. Attack Pup is a pen testing distribution of puppy. Slackbones actually came up because there were a bunch of people who wanted a 64-bit distribution, and there were only two options. So me and one of the other developers put one together that is literally bare bones. It's based on Slackware 64.14. You boot to X, and that's it. You have no other applications. If you want an application, you're going to have to use wget from the command line to actually pull it down and then manually install it. It was bare bones. C compiler? Hmm, excuse me? Does it have a C compiler? Yes, it does have a C compiler. It has all the build tools, so you can compile all you want. Um, it was designed for other people who wanted a specific system, but didn't have the actual skill level to go in and actually build the system how we build it, which I will describe later. Um, RP2. Um, is random pup Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi has a hardware random number generator built into it. Um, I was looking to get one for my network, but unfortunately, hardware random number generators are extraordinarily expensive. Well, the Raspberry Pi has one, so I built a headless system of Puppy that basically allows you to access the hardware random number generator over a network on your LAN. Single purpose unit, that's what it was for. Um, Cloud Pup was me working to put own cloud on a Raspberry Pi. Um, quite honestly, I wouldn't recommend it. The Raspberry Pi does not have the strength to actually push the hardware requirements that own cloud needs. It works, but it works kind of slow. Um, Lighthouse Pup is the 64-bit um, version of Puppy Linux that I help co-develop. I'm a support developer for it. Same with Fat Dog 64. I'm um, also one of the Yassi Pi developers. It was a Kickstarter project to take the Yassi search engine, which is a distributed peer-to-peer -peer search engine, so that Google can't track what you're actually searching, and put it on a standalone Raspberry Pi so you can plug it into your network and do anonymous searching. I also am possibly going to become a Sailfish developer. I used to do development with Palm OS. Um, I'm sick and tired of Android, so if I get time in my day, I will eventually start working on Sailfish. That's kind of still up for debate, though, if I'm going to have time. Okay, about Puppy Linux. It was originally created in 2003. The first official release was actually in 2006. Barry Knauer, or Knauer, I always say his name wrong. Um, he was the chief developer up until September 2013 where he retired. He just kind of wanted to focus on his own things. Originally, he started working on Puppy because it was fun. It was something he wanted to work on and the community developed around him and he continued working. Now he just wants to take a back seat and just play around again, do some fun little projects of his own. They're still based on Puppy, but he's not leading the main development. Um, the community's kind of stepped up and has continued the development. The main project that we're working on is what's called Wolf, and that is our build system for how we build Puppy Linux, and I will get into that in a moment. From the beginning, Puppy's design goals were to be extraordinarily easy to use and install it on pretty much any medium that you have. 
um, USB zip drive, you can put it on SD cards. It should run entirely in RAM. You can boot it from a CD and DVD and any changes you make can be saved back to that disk. So you can actually have a persistent CD or a persistent DVD. Now obviously that will only work until you fill up the drive. Um, unless you have an RW and then you can try to erase. I've never personally done it. Success rate, I don't really know how well it's going to be. Um, Puppy was designed to be very friendly. You have an old system or someone has an old system and they just want to get online. You plug it in, you get online, you can browse the web, you can send emails. It's meant to be very, very simple to use. Now if you want to get in and dig into it, you're going to need some skill levels um, above just a random user because of how everything is actually done. But for just standard user computer actions, we want it to be as easy as possible. Like I said, it will run extraordinarily fast. The primary reason from this is because it runs from RAM. Um, and I will touch on that in just a moment. I will have all the applications for needed for daily use. These are the typical things like a document writer, a spreadsheet. Um, so you can send emails, you can play music, you can watch movies. The versions of the programs that we use and the actual versions of programs that we use um, are sometimes not the ones you're familiar with. The reason we've chosen those is because we're looking to keep the size as minimal as possible. Right now, the latest official release of Puppy, the entire OS, GUI, and all applications is about 140 megabytes. Compared to a distribution like Fedora where you're talking multiple gigabytes, we want to keep Puppy as minimal as possible. So we have to choose applications that have the smallest size and will run on the most efficient code. Um, again, it will just work. We want you to be able to take the USB, install it to a USB, stick it in any computer, and it run. We don't want you to have to spend time figuring out how to boot your system so you can do whatever you need to do. And because our focus is on being as lightweight as possible and using the minimum resources, we want to be able to breathe life into old PCs. And for an example of that, well, I'll hold there. This is one of the first pictures, uh, releases of Puppy. Um, it's 2003. Um, one of the things we hear, and I'll touch on it later, is that Puppy is kind of ugly. As you can see, it's not really that attractive. Um, there are some things that we're working on to make that better, but when you want to have a lightweight system, you're going to have to sacrifice some of the bells and whistles. Okay, example of old hardware that I can run Puppy on. Uh, Toshiba Protege. This system I still use today. As a matter of fact, the latest version of Puppy, which official version is Slacko 5.7, I believe, still runs on that system. Runs perfectly fine. I can boot it up, I can browse YouTube, I can send emails, I can write letters, I can watch movies. All perfectly fine on a 600 megahertz Pentium 3. Now if you take a normal Linux distribution and you try to load it on that system, you might as well start it up, go wash your car and cut your lawn, and then come back and you might have arrived at your GUI. Um, but Puppy is not limited to just minimal hardware. My development rig right here is a dual hexacore Xeon, it's a 24 thread processor, uh, 56 gig RAM and 24 terabytes. Now a lot of people immediately when I say that say there's no way Puppy's going to run on that, that's impossible. Well that's the system. Um, Puppy does in fact run on it um, and obviously it runs lightning fast. Um, now the Mariner right here, that's the version that I use which is the Lighthouse. Um, we are using a slightly older kernel, it's a 3.7, um, open box 3.5, but Puppy will run on virtually anything. That's one of our goals. If it runs fast on a 600 megahertz, you can guarantee it's going to run fast on your modern hardware. It's just one of the added benefits. Yes, it is. There you go. <laughs> Forgive me, they're Samsungs, and I know a lot of people think Samsungs are crap, but when you're buying six of them, you really don't want to spend $300 a monitor. And that laptop in the upper right is the one that's running all that, by the way. Yes, this one, this one up here, that's actually my Toshiba that still runs the <laughs> Pentium. Uh, that is a 200, or the 286, that's not running puppy. Um, and then a Pentium and a 386, they're not either. But yeah, that thing does. Yes, it will. Um, I have, um, right now I'm running two uh, NVIDIA GTX 60, 660 Ti's. Um, and with Zynorama, Puppy will span to all six screens. Um, people have reported with ATI being able to go to three screens. I don't know anyone else who's insane enough to try to go higher than that. Um, I'm kind of the loony oddball in the community. I like the power <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I'm not going for, uh, for pretty looks. Alrighty, 
Um, so the main things we're going to focus on, running from RAM, how we do it, why we do it. Layered file system, most people don't know what it is. I'm going to try to explain it as simply as I can. Squash file system, also something most people don't know what it is. I will try to explain it. Save files, Wolf, which is our build system. The benefits and the downsides of running Puppy, if you want to get involved, how you can. And then some sources, which we'll get to in a second. Um, so running from RAM, why do we do it? Well, we do it because disk I.O. is dumb. Um, disk I.O. for most things is the slowest part of your system. Now, thankfully, the Linux kernel is kind of smart with caching, so you don't notice it as much. But when you are on older hardware, you do not have the benefits of SATA drives. You can still be using old PATA drives, old IDE drives, and the I.O. on those is horrible. So running from RAM means your system when you need to load something, does not have to reach down to an extremely low drive to try to pull data off of it. Because it's already sitting in RAM, it's already ready to go. AUFS. Uh, the name is the same. The, what it tr actually defines as has changed three times. I don't know why, but it does. Um, it's basically another version of UnionFS, which the easiest way to describe it is who here remembers old school transparency sheets at school, where you had the overhead projector and the teacher had transparency sheets? The simplest way to explain a layered file system is like that. Take a whole bunch of transparency sheets. Take one of them and put your GUI on it. Take another and put KDE on it. Take another and put your browser on it. Individually, they exist as separate layers. When you put them together and stick them on the transparency sheet, what you see on the screen on the wall is all of them in your file system. This was how I felt the first time I tried to understand exactly the technical ways of how it works. Because even today, I cannot wrap my brains around the extraordinarily technical ways of how the layered file system works. I know how it works. I don't know how it works. Um, I just kind of accept that it does and appreciate what it does and just kind of let the guy who's developing it kind of do his own thing because it is way above my level. Um, so when Puppy boots, you have your base system. And like I said, you have layers that will go on top of it. Now, in this situation, I just kind of threw things in to identify different layers. Um, it's important to realize that these layers here, except for the top one, are all read-only. And I'll get to that in a second. But as you load in layers, the layered file system is layered in, everything is laid on just like a new transparency sheet with new files in it. Now, you as the user, you don't notice anything different. The system on itself does. OK, right here we have um, DF output. And we see all these different loop devices. All these different loop devices are actually different layers that are layered into the file system here. And they're all put under the subdirectory in it RD. Because again, remember, we're running entirely from RAM. So once the kernel loads and it loads the init script, it then creates the init RD directory and it starts layering everything into RAM. From the system side, this is what it sees. From the user side, you don't see that. Obviously, you can go into the actual directory and see the individual layers. But if you just go to the root directory, you're going to see the file system like you've always seen it. You're going to see your user directory. You're going to see your lib directory. You're going to see your Etsy. You're going to see all of those. Um, the different layers are titled for the order that they are um, in your system. Pup RO2 is an important layer, which I'll get to in a second. The rest of them are just additional layers that you can add in as you want. While you're using your system, you can load and unload different layers at will. And I'll get to why you might want to do that later. Um, here's an example of one of the actual layers. Now, here we are in the initRD directory. We're looking specifically at the pup ro14 layer. And as you see, inside that layer is your standard file system that you would normally see. You have an SD directory, user directory, and a var directory. Um, this, I believe, is actually Cupzilla. Um, or it's QMMP. I forget which one I used for this. Uh, but the layer itself is that. So if you look at the individual layer, you will only see the files from that application. You will see nothing else. If you step back to your root file system, you will see these files and these directories in your file system like you would normally want to see them. Um, now, we accomplish this by using what's called a squash FS. We take this layer and we compress it down into a single file so that it's easy to use. Um, that allows us to take our separate layers and work with them individually. So I can take QMMP, I can take that layer, and I can load it when I need a media player if I want to. Now I have QMMP in my system. I can play MP3s, whatever. If I don't want to use it anymore, I can now unload that layer out of memory. Now again, it's just a single file on the hard disk. 
that contains all this. The layered file system understands that, and when you load it, it then extracts that, those files, puts them in memory, and then layers them in. Um, now when I say compression, oh, I'll get to that in a second. This is, yes, it was QMMP. This is actually the files that are inside the user bin directory. Now if you went out to root and you went to user bin, you would see all the other files in your system. But since we are specifically within this layer, all we're gonna see is that layer. Again, with the old transparency analogy. If you took one of those transparency sheets out and looked at it, you wouldn't see everything else that was on the wall that was projected. You would only see the layers in that file. And these layers are read-only. Um, as you see here, I cannot create anything. I can't create a file or a folder. Now this has an added security benefit, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but the individual SFS layers in the layered file system are read only. This is very important to realize because this also gives us a couple benefits which we will get to in a second. As I said, we're using these via what's called a squash file system, which is a compressed read only file system for Linux. That is how we contain our layers on the physical hard disk to load in different layers into the OS. Um, here's an example of the compression that it has. The extracted uncompressed system is 69, mega, or yeah, 69 megabytes. But the actual compressed file that resides on my hard drive that I'm loading into RAM is actually only 14 meg. Um, I'm not sure of the exact compression format. I think it's LZMA. Um, but we are able to save a lot of actual disk space while still having all the files that we need. Again, on older hardware, this is benefit because a lot of older things don't have the larger hard drives that we do nowadays. Okay, so taking AUFS and our squash file systems together, we can load and unload layers from our file system whenever we desire. What this means is, is I can boot up my system and I can have OpenBox running, I can have Firefox running, I can have LibreOffice running, I can have all these layers loaded in. And halfway through I can decide, you know what, I need to load a server because I need someone else to download files off my system. So I load my Apache server in, my LAMP stack, they connect, they get what they need. At that point I can unload that layer and Apache is gone. It's no longer in my file system. I can allow people to connect to my system because I can load and unload a server at will. And when it's unloaded, it does not exist at all. The file system, it's not there. Um, it also allows us to completely change the way our system is set up. So if I prefer one browser and someone else prefers another browser and we use the same system, I can use Chrome. They can sit down without rebooting if they want to, unload Chrome, load Firefox, and there we go. Now some people don't understand why why, why don't you just leave them all loaded? Well again, because we're focusing on older hardware, we're talking about limited resources. If I'm only using one browser, I don't need to have two or three browsers loaded into RAM taking up memory. Um, it allows you to adapt your system as you need it. We kind of have the attitude in the general Linux community of an, everything in the kitchen sink. You install your distro, you grab every piece of software you might possibly want, throw it on there, and when you have a two terabyte drive, that's fine, because it's just going to sit there, it's going to take up space, it's not going to do anything else. From a security standpoint though, you do have the problem that you are loading tons of potential attack vectors onto your system that are doing nothing but sitting there. Now for most people, that's not a concern. For some though that are a little extra paranoid, they don't want to have different things sitting on their drive potentially able to be exploited. Um, now as I've said, all of these layers are read only. You cannot change them. So what happens if I load a layer, like a browser, and I go in and change my browser configs. Well, what happens? Because those files in that layer, I can't change. Well, what happens is that there's a special subdirectory, which is the pup-rw directory, and every change in the system goes into that directory. So if I go in and I change my configs, I will have a file that will be created in that layer. The original files are still there. My changed file is going to exist in this fresh new layer, that I can read to and write anytime I need. Now this has several benefits. Okay, here's an example. Inside this read-write layer, these are all the changes that I have made to the system. I have stuff in bin because I've installed programs. Um, in my root directory, I'm going to have all my configs in my .config directory. Now, 
when I, like again, browser, web browser, if I go in and I edit the configs, I'm going to have a file that's created in here. My original file is still going to be in the system. So if I go in and I edit a file and I totally mess everything up, all I have to do is go into my layer, delete my file that I tried to edit, and instantly the file system is smart enough to realize, hey, I have an older copy of that file in a lower layer. And instantly the system will revert back to the original copy, seamlessly. So if you want to tinker, this is a very good system to be able to learn how to tinker with. Because you don't have to worry about totally screwing up your system and then having to reinstall. Because any change you make is in that directory. So worst case scenario, you drop to shell, you CD into this directory, you delete whatever file you're working on, you start X, and you're back. Um, this again also has an added security benefit of there are certain files which should never exist in this directory unless you have done it. For instance, the Etsy directory. I should never have any changes going into any of certain files in my Etsy directory unless I'm doing it. So if one day I notice that, hey, wait a second, my ld.so.conf file in my Etsy directory, why do I have that in my save layer? I've never changed that. Well, that means somebody else has changed it or something else has changed it. I can go in and look and see exactly what's going on. Um, and if I'm not sure and I'm not, what's going on, why is this file here? No problem. Delete it. Problem solved. Um, I actually have a cron job that runs continually that compares the contents of this directory of Etsy and bin with my base layer. So it, every 10 minutes it will run and it will look to see if there is a file difference between this directory and that directory. If it finds one, it runs a difference, it takes the original file, the edited file, the difference, packs them up in a tarbell and then emails it out to me. So if somebody sits down in my system and starts tinkering and doing whatever, within 10 minutes I'm going to get an email saying, hey, somebody edited this file in your Etsy directory. Of course, all I have to do is go see exactly what the change is, because they can't edit the base layer. They can only edit this top layer, which is editable. So I can go in and see exactly what's changed, and I can just delete it, and instantly my system reverts back to its original copy. Now, these files right here, these are what's called a whiteout file. These are very important because this is how a layered file system works when you delete a layer that's technically on a lower layer, which is read-only. If I have a file, say my hostname file, and I decide I don't want a hostname at all, I'm not even going to have the hostname file in the Etsy directory. Well, I can't actually edit it, so I have to be able to tell my system some way that that file doesn't exist anymore. And what it does is I create a whiteout file of the hostname file in the Etsy subdirectory. The AUFS file system will see that, and just like whiteout does on a piece of paper, We'll place that over so the actual original file in the base layer is no longer accessible. Now if I want it to become accessible again, I jump into this directory, delete out my whiteout file, and the base file is back and visible again. And again, this is another example of, this is when I installed my NVIDIA drivers. Um, this is the user bin directory, and you can see that the only programs that have been installed since I booted the system, I installed GFTP, I installed NVIDIA, and I installed the tree program. Um, that's it. So no other binaries have been put on my system. So I don't have to worry that somebody has snuck something on there, my sister decided to play a prank on me and install things on my system, because I can look right there and see, okay, that's all I've got. I've got my base system, which I know what it has, and now I've got that. Now, this folder, my editable layer. When I shut down my system, well, I've made changes. I don't want those to go away. I want to save those changes. So what we do is we create a very special type of squash file system, which is this layer in one file. So all the changes that you've made to your system, all your config files, all your edits, if you've downloaded some documents, that are in this directory get saved into one file that's then placed on your hard drive. And you can choose wherever you want to save it. If you want to save it to a USB stick, you can do that. You want to save it to your internal drive, you can do that. You want to save it to a CD, you can do that. You can save that save file on any media that you want. This file can be encrypted if you choose. Uh, currently we use, I think it's AES. I think the other option is actually DES. I don't know why we still have that in the code, but we do. Um, as I said, it can be saved at any, at any device. Now when you create a save file, you just choose a random size. You can choose, okay, 512 meg, you can choose a gig. If later you decide, you know what, I want to throw more stuff in there, I want to add more to my system, you can simply make it larger. 
you can have multiple save files on your system. What this allows you to do is when you boot the system, is Puppy will recognize, hey, you've got two different types of save files on your system with different names. Which one do you want to load? Puppy by design does not have multi-user capability. It is one user. That's all you are. This allows you to sort of have a multi-user system. Unfortunately, you would have to reboot. So you can have a system where you've got all your changes saved in your save file. Someone else, wife, friend, girlfriend, brother, sister, can also use the same system and all their changes can be in their own save file. Um, again, that's why you would want encryption so nobody messes with your stuff. Um, now, these changes. This directory, the pupro directory, as a user, by default, it will save every 30 minutes. So this directory, any changes you make will be saved back to your save file. You can change that if you like. You can change it to every minute, although I wouldn't suggest it because you're going to waste a lot of time and a lot of CPU power just writing layers. Or you can set it to every hour, every three hours, or you can set it to never. If you want to just use your system and you don't care what happens, you want to be able to shut down your system and blow everything out so the next day you start it, it's clean and fresh, you just choose never save and it won't. So you can set up your system and then never change it again so nothing that happens on your system is ever going to be saved. No browser history, no nothing. And because we're writing always to RAM, nothing is getting saved into any cache on your hard disk. So you don't have to worry about someone coming along later and going, I think this guy's up to no good. Noah, you've been being a naughty boy. I can't take his hard drive and try to see what he's been doing because after all, that layer is in RAM. And when he shuts down his system, it's gone. Yes, I understand there are cold boot attacks where you can take an aerosol can and stick it upside down. But if you're that paranoid, you've got bigger problems than what puppy is going to solve. <laughs> Now, added benefit. <laughs> um, as I said, this is saved to a single file on your system. I have a cron job that once a day will make a backup copy of that save file. All it does is copy it from the main disk to an external removable disk. So my system, to back it up, all I have to do is make a copy of that save file. If my drive dies, put a new drive in, I take that backup copy of the save file, put it back on my main drive, and instantly my system is back up and running. Um, that I'm aware of, no other Linux system allows you to be able to back up and restore that quickly. Most of the time you have to reinstall your whole OS, then you have to go in and download all your programs again, then you have to go in and reconfigure all your programs again. Because everything is contained within that save file, as long as you have a copy of it, you can restore your system by simply dragging and dropping. I wouldn't recommend dragging and dropping because that means you have to remember to do it. It's easiest if you write a simple cron job just to make a copy of it every once in a while. Um, I tell people this, and usually most people initially don't believe me. They're like, no, no, you can't do that. It's not possible. Because of the way the different layers work, it is possible. It makes it very easy and very seamless. Um, it's also really convenient when I want to move from one system to another. If I put a new drive in my system, I don't have to worry about doing a whole image of my drive. Again, one file you're copying. It's about as simple as it can get. Okay, moving along, Wolf. Wolf is how we actually build Puppy. It is a shell script. Um, you can build Puppy out of many distributions. Puppy at its core is more of a design philosophy of how to build a Linux distribution. Um, right now, we currently support those distributions. Um, there are people that are working on others. Um, what Puppy does is, is we use the binaries from other distributions. We do this for several reasons. One, it means it has less work for us to do because we don't have to compile every package. Two, it means you as the users have the added benefit of having the entire software catalog that another distribution has already put forth the effort on. We, there's no reason for us to spend our time duplicating the effort that someone else has done. So if you build a puppy or someone builds a puppy out of Debian and you want to install a package, all you have to do is go to debian.org, download the package, install it, and it's going to run. Now. Because Puppy is minimal, you will probably have to install more than just the package because we probably do not have these libraries that it's going to be needing. Um, because we strip out anything that you don't need to run your system. So if you go grab, I don't know, give me a program, Noah. Gimp. 
GIMP. Okay, you want to go grab GIMP. GIMP is going to rely on a lot of different image libraries that may or may not be on installed in the actual puppy version that you're using. So you may have to actually download the Debian packages for those libraries as well. It's kind of one of the sticking points we're working on dependency resolution. But we kind of have the fun because every distribution kind of does packages in their libraries a little differently. And we're operating off of one script to do all these different distributions. Um, like I said, you, will, you can build it out of all these. So all of the binaries in this system right here, um, this is actually the alpha version of the uh, next version that we're coming out with, which is based on Slackware 14.1. So this is binary compatible with every package with Slackware 14.1. So if I want to install a package and we don't have a native Puppy Linux package for it, I can go to any Slackware repo, I can grab the Slack build script, and I can build it and it will run. Um, live CDs used to be around 100 to 130 meg. Right now we're kind of pushing around 150 meg. Um, we actually have some people in our community which are very upset that we're getting to that level. They want to kind of bring it back down. Um, personally, I don't think it's that much of an issue, an extra 20 meg on an ISO. Um, so, yeah, well, if we ever get to a DVD, we have failed horribly. <laughs> um, this is actually just a picture of Wolf running. Um, and you can see here, we choose what, you know, binary, what we're going to call it, where we're going to pull our packages from, what compatible distro we're going to be. And this script will go out, grab the packages that it needs from whatever distribution, and then take that along with all of the scripts that actually make Puppy work. Um, Puppy works off of shell scripts. That is the heart and soul of Puppy. Because of that, and I'll, I'll touch on this, if you want to get involved in Puppy, all you need to know is Bash. Because we do not have complicated systems. Everything with how Puppy works is controlled through shell scripts. The layering of different layers into the file system, the saving of the different layers, the loading of the RAM, all of that is done specifically through shell scripts. Now, those of you that are System D fans will hate this. Um, because we use the older sysv in it, and I don't see us moving anytime soon because we want to do everything by shell script. We want it to be easier to use and easier to edit if you want to hack around with it. Okay, benefits. Um, again, you're running from RAM. I don't care how old your RAM is, it's faster than whatever drive you have. Uh, <laughs> even if you have an SSD, your RAM is faster. Um, there's just no way around it. Um, Flexible due to installation options. Again, you can install it to anything you want. If you have a medium lying around, go for it. USB drive somewhere, go for it. Um, I have ex actually installed Puppy on a zip disk just because I didn't believe it would actually work, and someone told me that it would, and I lost the bet. Um, it did not load very fast because zip disks are not exactly fast medium, but it did work. Um, so if you know someone that lives in a third world country and they have an overabundant supply of zip disks, this is the distro for them. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, compromise and corruption protection. Because any change to the system occurs in that one special layer, you can see when something changes. If I download a bad package, I install a bad package, it is contained within that layer. I don't have to go hunting through my file system and pull the actual file list off of a web server to find out what files I need to go in and try to delete. They're all there, they're all self-contained. If my system is compromised, well, any change is gonna be isolated to that directory. So I can go in and I can take it out. Can you make your own layers? Yes, you can. Um, making layers is actually very CPU intensive because of the compression, the way it works, but you can create layers. What a lot of the developers will actually do is we'll take the stock system, um, we'll, we'll install it. We will then take all the different programs that we personally want to use, we'll then add them into one layer. We'll then take that layer and bundle that with our base layer and make a brand new base layer. Um, for the average user, it is possible we actually have a script which will help you do that. Um, it's simply called edit SFS, we're really good with names. Um, <laughs> and it will take your SFS file and it will allow you to edit it. Other than that, that is the only way to edit an SFS layer because what it does is it creates an even higher layer in RAM which is standalone and kind of locked off. It's kind of like a sandbox for your file system in a way. You can make any changes you want there and then save it and it will then create a new version of that SFS package which then you can do whatever you want with. So you can go in and tweak them and change them. So you know, if you have custom setup that you want and you don't want to deal with a save file, you can kind of bundle that all the in with your base layer. Stuff so that you can do it on your big X64 
four box and put it on an ARM little thingy? Yes, that is actually how we build the Puppy Linux versions for ARM, is we just do cross-compiling. Okay. Um, because has anybody tried to compile on a Raspberry Pi? Okay, don't waste your time. You have? I feel sorry for you. You should not have done that. Um, yes, we can cross-compile. Um, you just have to load all the appropriate stuff. All righty. Okay, so these are all our benefits. Now, downsides. There's a big one that everyone likes to bring up. <laughs> uh, puppy runs as root. Um, this is getting better. Uh, we now have it so when you start up, all of your internet applications will run as a non-privileged user called Spot. You can manually start any program you want as a non-privileged user. But by default, Puppy runs as root. This comes from its original purpose of single user, single purpose, let's get old hardware back up and running. Um, you know, it was designed for the guy who wants to get his grandmother on Linux because he really doesn't like that she's on Windows, and she's not really going to be doing much other than watching cat videos on YouTube and sending emails around. So it doesn't matter if she has root because she's been running Windows as root forever, so there's no real difference. <laughs> for us Linux guys, obviously, we hear that you're running as root and, you know, grab the pitchforks, start the bonfires because we're going after some people. Uh, so we're, we're working on getting to this. Uh, the latest version of FatDog64 all the user applications start as spot, um, especially all your internet applications. Uh, the downside is, if you are running Puppy, and you have a normal Linux distro, let's say you're running Arch or Fedora on your system, and you're you know, playing around with Puppy on the side, if you're writing files to any of your removable media, realize that the permissions on those files are all going to be root. So when you jump back to your normal distribution, and you then say you, you know, save some music, and you're like, okay, I'm you know, on my art system, let me go play that music that I got the other day. Oh, wait, I can't because the permissions on those music files are root. So you'd have to go in and bring them back, chimote them. So, yeah, run as root, that's the biggest complaint we get. The second biggest complaint is package management. We do have a native package management system. Personally, I think it's horrible. Um, any of the puppy guys that see this later do not yell at me because you know that's how I feel. Um, we have what's called a .pet file. Again, we're really good with names. Um, and it's basically just a compressed RGZ file with the necessary information of where it's going to get saved. Um, we don't really address this issue because we're basing Puppy off of other distributions. You can grab packages from other distributions if you need it. Um, in the official release Slacko, if you open up the package manager, you actually have the option of searching the official Slackware repositories for whatever you want. Um, so it's kind of a problem that we address, and we're like, yeah, it's a problem, but yeah, it's not really that much of a problem because you're just going to install from Slackware anyway, so we're not going to waste the time. Um, no central location for information and packages, etc. This is my personal beef. Puppy stuff is scattered all over the web, and you will see this when I get to where the sources are if you want more information. There is stuff ever. We have official packages that are on rapid share right now. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bone of contention with me. There are a few of us that are working at trying to kind of bring everything under one umbrella to create a CDN where we can distribute everything seamlessly. But a lot of the people that are developers like myself, I originally got into it because it was fun. It's a fun hobby for me. This is not a job. This is something I do because I enjoy it. So when you're doing something strictly because it's enjoyable and then someone comes up to you and goes, hey, I know you're having fun, but I don't want you to have fun. I want you to do what I think you want to do. You're not really as likely to jump on that. Um, so advancement is yeah, it's a little bit on the slow, slow side. The coding style, again, most of us that work in Puppy, we are not professional coders. We are amateurs. As a result, if you go and look through our shell scripts, you will be horrified. <laughs> there, there was, it was a, probably about a year ago, I was going through one of them, and someone had actually, in the comments, made notes to themselves about things they needed to get from the grocery store. Because apparently they were on their system and they were doing this and they had, oh, i got to remember to do that. So they saved it there as their notes because it was on their screen so they could go to it later. They forgot this and it got saved and, and it got shipped. Um, of course, in other cases, certain shell scripts, you have no comments whatsoever. So you just see the code and unless you can step through it in your head, you're going to go, okay, that does, I don't know what that does. But that's probably important. I'm not going to mess with it. Um, we are working at getting that better. We just recently, finally, got on Git. So we now actually, yes, I'm so happy. We now actually can do real development. Um, 
with multiple people instead of, hey, here's a new file of the script that I wrote. I'm going to upload it to the forum so you guys can download it. And maybe somebody will use it, and maybe not. Um, as I said, a lot of people say puppy is ugly. And I got to confess, out of the box, JWM is not the most beautiful thing in the world. We have kind of gotten spoiled with GNOME and KDE, and you kind of expect there to be some flair. Well, because we're trying to keep it simple, you're going to sacrifice flair. Now, there are some things you can do to make Puppy a lot more attractive with it. Not too much effort. Um, this is actually the newest version. Um, this is what I am running. This is the 6.0 Alpha. And personally, I don't think that looks too bad. Um, the icon set, OK, maybe it's a little cheesy, but it's simple. In that way, I like it. Um, if you want kind of a, a little more flair, that is JWM. You can go with an open box setup. This is a setup of mine a while ago. I just kind of went crazy with kind of having icons everywhere. Um, but it's JWM with a temp2 panel down at the bottom. This is Gcrawlm on the side, LX panel. Those are W bar. Um, it's basically a launch bar for drives attached and quick applications. Um, and a DeLorean because we don't need roads. <laughs> we do it our own way. Screw roads. We're doing it that way. Um, yes, and Mr. Fusion. Don't forget Mr. Fusion. Um, this is actually, it scales very, very badly. Um, and it's very, very dark. And you can't really see it with the lights on. This is actually off of my six screen setup. Um, but again, it doesn't scale very well. But that is, that is it. Um, nice, empty, not much there. What, what's the full resolution? The full resolution on that system is 5760 by 2160. Um, which then when I jump to this netbook, which is 1024 by 600, it hurts <laughs> so bad. Because everything is right there. And I'm like, wait, I need, I need another screen over here. Alrighty. So getting involved. Um, like I said, if you're interested in getting to, you know, involved or you just want to poke around, all you need to know is Bash. You don't need to know Perl. You don't need to know Python. It's Bash. It's about as simple as you can get. Um, here's an example of our wonderful resources. <clears throat> we have our official site, which is puppylinux.com. We have an official community site, which is .org. We have the developer's blog, who's now retired, which is bkhome.org. We have an official forum on Merga Linux. We have a backup forum on .info. We have a wiki on .org. We have an official search page. I don't really know why we have an official search page, but all it is is it just searches with the Google tag of site.mergolinux.com. So really, it's just a Google search. Uh, we have our GitHub official repo, and we have our Wolf Community Edition mailing list. Um, as far as IRC, we're in Puppy Linux. There's really nobody there. I think there's maybe like 20 people. Um, because it's kind of a hobby for most people, they're not sitting at their computer all day. So you can leave people messages. And they'll get back to you when you're not around. Um, me, this is my site, q5sys.sh. All of these slides will be uploaded there probably by the end of this weekend. It depends how good the internet connection is here at the hotel. Um, I will try to upload them. Um, and I'll have a post on the main page so you can get them. So all these will be available. Um, <clears throat> email address, you're going to notice the star there. That's because you can put anything in front of the at sign, and I will get it. You can put, hey, you. You can put, that guy. You can put, I think you are a bad speaker, and I will get it. Um, Twitter handle is Q5Sys. Shameless plug. As I said, I am one of the producers with uh, Jupiter Broadcasting for the Linux Action Show and for Linux Unplugged. Um, if any of you are involved with or know any projects that you think should get some attention, have them contact me at that email address. Um, we desperately want to actually reach out and get to know some of the smaller projects that don't get the attention. Um, so send me a message. So that is, that's the talk, I believe. Yep, that's it. So any questions? Yes. What about running Puppy in the cloud, maybe internet space? Is this a security problem? Or are you going to be rooted in a few minutes? Um, well, the version that I put out with OwnCloud, OwnCloud runs as a non-root user. Um, so that wasn't as much of an issue. Uh, I would not personally use Puppy as a server unless you're just hosting something for somebody that you know. Um, this is more of a desktop use only. I wouldn't recommend it for anything outside that. Um, the file system that you were talking about and, and the layered file system, 
um, you said it was AUFS now. Is that something that comes by default in Puppy configured? No, well, OK. I'm going to answer that question another question. Okay. AUFS comes configured by default in Puppy. Um, the question was, you know, with AUFS, with the layered file system, how does that work with Puppy? We set it up for you. Now, if you want to compile your own kernel, a newer version, you're going to have to patch your kernel for the layered file system. It does not come in mainline kernel. There has been discussion about working that in. Um, when that's going to happen, I don't know. Send Linus a question and ask. Um, but yes, as far as the layered file system goes, we have coordinated all of that for you. It's already in there. It's already ready to go. Only time you need to mess with that is if you want to compile a custom kernel, you want to upgrade, so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, a similar question I was going to ask if you were thinking of going to OverlayFS or Butter, because they do overlap. Okay, the question was about OverlayFS or ButterFS. Um, ButterFS and AUFS do not work together. Um, there have been reports that everything just goes horribly awry. I've never personally tried it. Um, OverlayFS I don't have any familiarity with. Uh, the actual, the one version of a layered file system that is in the kernel is the older Union uh, file system. A lot, of the ver a lot of the features in AUFS when it was developed have been rolled into the original UnionFS with the UnionFS version 2. Um, AUFS, we're on version 3 now, has more features than the current version of UnionFS. There's been dialogue of maybe kind of rolling them all together. It hasn't happened yet. Um, could you use another layered file system? Yes. How you would be able to work that, I'm not quite sure, because that would depend on the intricacies of what's different between Union File System and AOFS. I know off the top of my head, I believe, actually, um, that the whiteout files that I was talking about are handled differently with AOFS than they are with UnionFS. Um, so any other layered file systems, it could work, yes. How it could work, don't really know, because I've never looked into it. Regarding your hostname example, you said that um, if I wanted to, for example, delete the hostname, I would go in and, and I have to make a change to that, that whiteout file. What would happen if I just went into you know, Etsy and just deleted the hostname file? Will the file system automatically do that whitelist change for me? Or is yes. If you are deleting, the question was, you know, if you want to, my example of deleting the hostname file. If you want to delete a file that's in your base layer, now obviously it's read-only. You can't actually touch that file. But when you go into your file manager or you drop to the shell and you delete that file, the file system itself will take care of all the technical work. It will go, this user wants to delete this file. This file is in a read-only layer. I can't touch it, so I'm going to create the whiteout file in the read-write layer, which I will then cover up that file so when the user is looking at their system and the programs are looking, they don't see it. Um, so yes, you don't actually have to do that. AUFS handles all that on your own. Um, that's why I said there's some things I know how it works. I don't know the specifics of exactly how that implementation is carried out at that level. Um, but yes, that does happen. Any other questions? On your home unit, uh, what kind of development work do you do on there? Just puppy stuff, or do you do all kinds of work do you do for others? OK, the question was on my home unit, what kind of development stuff I'm doing. Uh, right now, specifically just puppy stuff. Um, I do a lot of VM work uh, because it allows me to you know, implement a change, spin up a VM, and see, oh, wow, that didn't work. My system won't boot now, um, instead of actually having to sit there and reboot the system. So I can have five or six different VMs loaded. And of course, because it's puppy, the VMs actually don't require much memory. Um, so I can have multiple changes running and then see, OK, which change actually makes things faster. Um, one of the, the scripts that we use for saving the changes in that read-write layer to your save file is called the snap merge script. And we've been working on trying to make that script faster. Well, for me, it's easy because I can make multiple different changes that people recommend, spin up three or four different VMs, institute a command at the same time across all three of them, and see which one actually finishes first. And if I'm looking at my actual system, I can say, OK, you know, I don't have one VM that's just hung up because VirtualBox is going out for lunch right now. Um, so for me, it allows me to do rapid testing a whole lot easier and a whole lot quicker than constantly having to reboot to see what a change does. So that's, you, you're using the, the Oracle VM? Uh, yes. Yes. For, for virtualization, mostly I'm using just VirtualBox through Oracle. Um, I have VMware. I'm not really using it just because for my purposes, VirtualBox works. It's simple. 
there's no reason to go for all the extra features for you know what I'm doing. Noah, did you have another question? Um, with regarding the um, the puppy running in RAM, is that something again? Once I boot it into Puppy, I, in theory, I should be able to remove the hard drive then, and Puppy would continue to work because it's working in this essentially virtual file system. Correct. Yeah. The question was, okay, if I, since it's running in RAM and I load Puppy off of a disk or whatever, can I then remove that disk? And this is actually what some people will do with USB sticks: is they'll take the USB stick, stick it in their system, boot it up, remove the USB stick. Their system is running entirely in RAM now because they've removed the media. Well, obviously they can't save any changes to a save file anywhere. But yes, you can continue to still use your system because your system is residing in the file system that is actually in RAM. So whatever device you're booting from doesn't matter anymore. Um, with booting from a CD or a DVD, one of the reasons we do that is because somebody can boot off a CD, pull that CD out of their system, and then take a CD of music, stick it in their system, and play music off of it. Or take a DVD, stick it in there, and watch a movie because they don't need the OS on the live CD. Um, if you've used a live CD from most other distributions, you stick it in, you boot up, everything's fine. You then go to load an application and you have to sit there and wait while your CD spools up and it actually copies that information into memory and then loads it. Because we're running entirely from RAM, Puppy doesn't have that problem. Everything you've got, all your applications from boot are there and ready to go. You can pull out your disk, your USB, whatever you want, and you can still run. How much memory does it take? Um, the late, well, actually, Hold on. Let me see if I can pull up on this one. Actually, I've done a lot of changes on this one, so that might not be um, inadequate. Total RAM, um, the Toshiba that I'm running has 320 meg RAM total. When I boot um, Slack 057 off of it, I have around 100 and some meg left. So it's used about 200. Any others? All right, well, that's kind of Puppy Linux in a nutshell. Um, we kind of do everything different, but that's because we have different goals and we like the way it is. So, thank you. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.